gente sabe que educação se dá na presença. E de uma hora para outra, esse lugar tão especial do aprendizado teve que mudar. Em tempos de mudança, é muito importante lembrar que estamos juntos. Agora, a empatia e a colaboração são ainda mais importantes para a gente seguir construindo futuros mais brilhantes. É sobre isso o Cambridge Day 2020, colaboração em tempos de mudança. Nosso evento sempre foi um momento de encontro, celebração e aprendizado. Esse ano seguiremos juntos, ao vivo, com palestrantes do mundo todo, cada um na sua própria casa. Então nós temos um encontro marcado dos dias 20 a 24 de julho. Inscreva-se em cambridgeday.org.br. Vem com a gente construir mais um Cambridge Day. Hello everyone, welcome to day two of Cambridge Day 2020. My name is Renata Simões and I'll be with you during this week when we are going to learn and share experiences, content, researches with renowned EOT experts from all over the world. This is the annual event promoted by Cambridge University Press, focused on the English language teaching professionals this year, connecting Latin American professionals and fellows from different countries in this unique online event. And talking about online, are you guys already uh, checked on our uh, social networks, Facebook, Instagram? Are you there on Facebook, Instagram? Please don't forget to tag us, Cambridge University Press and Cambridge Brazil, on your posts and stories. And now, ta-da, I know a a lot of you guys are already talking and chat about having a pen and a paper for this, our first webinar uh, of the day. Uh, our, first speak our first speaker is a well-known author who recently released the book 100 Teaching Tips by Cambridge University Press. Vocabulary to her is probably the most important component of prof proficiency This is a tough one, proficiency for students. Talking to us from her home in Israel, West, West, talking, to, talking to us from her home in Israel, where she lives. Please welcome the teacher educator, Penny Ur. Hi, Penny. Nice to have you here with us. Did I say it properly, your surname? Because I was very concerned about it. <laughs> Yes, that's fine. Can you hear me? Ah, yeah, yeah, I can hear you. So well, you're, you are in Israel. What time is it now there? Well, it's um, eight o'clock in Israel and it's dark outside, sun has set and it's uh, about 30 degrees centigrade. Oh. So, <laughs> so thank you very time. much for receiving us in your home at this time of the day, the beginning of the evening and everything. <laughs> Lovely to be with you. Oh, lovely. Just before you start, uh, I always think when you talk about uh, vocabulary, which are everybody's favorite words in English, because mine are all, I love the all, the, the whole thing about the mem, even that say that the, the tricky parts uh, that they play with the all and the awesome words. And you, do you have a favorite quest, uh, favorite word, uh, favorite word of vocabulary in English? Yes, my favorite word is serendipity because it sounds so nice ah. and it's a lovely meaning. It means it means having being lucky, doing things by chance that turn out really well, and uh, it's a great quality to have. And it's a lovely word, serendipity. Yeah, yeah serendipity is amazing. I like the all because more because of the sound. I didn't get this meaning, exactly. but we have a lot of words in English that you have. Actually, no translation even for Portuguese because they are so, I would say, they, they feel a whole blank of it. So have a great webinar. Thank you again for being with Thank us. Thank you very much. Thanks. <laughs> okay. I'd like to uh, start my uh, presentation then. Um, I'd just like to say before I start, you've been asked, of course, to have pencil and paper. I'll tell you it's not too much to do, but, but I do need you to be able to jot down things as we go. I'd also like to mention that uh, 
my presentation, although it's very, very practical, does refer occasionally to research. I haven't, during the presentation, there's no actual research references on the screen, but I have a full list of all the research uh, that's relevant to my talk at the end of the PowerPoint. So if you are interested in the references, in the research references, you just download the PowerPoint from the Cambridge site and you can see all the references you need. If you're not interested, then you don't have to. So it's as simple as that. Um, and uh, so, okay, let's start then. Um, so 20 tips, and I'll start with tip number one. Tip number one is very simple. Uh, spend a lot of class time vocabulary teaching um, for various reasons, because firstly, there is an enormous amount of vocabulary that the students need to know. Um, and secondly, because it's not true, that's the assumption some teachers have that they just pick it up. I remember when I was first starting to teach, you don't want to know when, most of you weren't born then, in the late 1960s. Um, <laughs> and that was the heyday of the audiolingual approach. And I was told, I remember very clearly being told, oh, you don't need to teach vocabulary, just teach them the grammar and they'll pick up the vocabulary as they go along. Well, it just is not true. You do need to teach it. Um, firstly, the amount. Um, research indicates that you need to know about 8,000 word families. Now, a, wait, a word family includes all sorts of derivatives, like, like if it's, you take the word act, then in the word family is activity, action, active, inactive, and so on, and so on, and so on. So every word family has a lot of words, so it works out as something like 20,000 words. In order to understand unsimplified reading texts, um, and there's been quite a lot of research on this, which indicates that this is this is so, which means that I don't know how your Portuguese system works or, or in other Latin American countries, but um, in Israel, we have eight years of English in schools, about 30, 40 weeks in the school year, which means that if you do your arithmetic, you've got to teach over this time about 25 word families a week, about 60 words a week. It's it's just mission impossible. It's an enormous amount. Um, and because we can't teach that huge amount, all we can say is, please, you do need to teach as many as possible. There is an enormous amount they need to know. They don't just pick it up. Uh, the research indicates that if you just pick up like you pick up the words in, in Portuguese or Spanish, your mother tongues, um, then you learn it mainly from, from interaction with other people and extensive reading, and you read an enormous amount in your mother tongue. But um, if we're talking about our learners who are learning English when everywhere around them people are speaking Portuguese or Spanish, um, they are unlikely to read enough to learn the new vocabulary. It's very slow learning for incidentally from new vocabulary, from extensive reading, which as I say, it doesn't matter if it's your mother tongue because you're reading an enormous amount. But if you are learning English, how much do your students read in, in L1? How much do they read in their mother tongue? Some students don't read very much in their mother tongue either. And, um, and in English, probably even less. So my message is, and this is my end of my first tip, not all the tips as long as this, don't worry, some of them are quite short. Do as much focused vocabulary teaching as you can in class, actually deliberately teaching, reviewing, and so on, and encourage students to acquire it outside through reading. Um, some, some students do still read, so read. <laughs> read stories, read read uh, children's books, read whatever you like. Uh, YouTube, uh, I have a, a grandson who spends a lot of time reading, watching YouTube, and I asked him if he was watching it with, um, with translations into Hebrew and not, and he said, oh no, I manage with the English. So that's great, that's probably where he's learning most of his English. Um, TV series of various kinds, um, gaming, all sorts of uh, uh, computer games where um, the English of interaction is, uh, the language of interaction, sorry, is English. Um, 
Tip number two, review again and again. A lot of reviewing. Teaching a word or an expression once is not enough. They will not remember it. Research indicates we need to encounter a word something like between six and 16 times in order to remember it. It's a lot of times. We just don't have time to teach all this enormous amount of vocabulary and to do six to 16 times review of every one. And the answer is, tentative answer from my own experience, is simply uh, to recycle as many times as you can. So at least twice, three times. If you can do more, great but do recycle. Some useful routines to help this incidentally, and now we're going to very, very practical tips, classroom tips. Um, if you've taught vocabulary at the beginning of the lesson, remind them at the end of the lesson. Remember what we learned at the beginning? Let's just go through, um, uh, through it again. Um, start the next lesson by asking them to recall. And then, uh, later on, yes, no pages, an idea you might not be familiar with, giving students a page with 20, 30 of the, the items you've taught them in the last week or two, and simply asking them to tick off all the ones they remember the meanings of, and then ask them to tell you what ones they didn't remember and review them. Very, very quick and easy way of, um, of reviewing um, new vocabulary and focusing in on the ones which perhaps they need reminding of. Um, someone said I, I missed it that now I'm I'm just relating to it. Now someone said in the chat box about personal relating personally to the vocabulary. Yes, very, very important as, as I'll come into that later. The things which you can relate to yourself or or in some way process in a personal way, you're going to remember better. Tip three teach multi-word items, not just single words. There's a sort of um, mistake that some beginner teachers think that vocabulary is words. It isn't words, it's wor it is words actually. It's words, but it's also multi-word items, which are referred to in the literature in all sorts of ways. Um, phrases, um, uh, lexical phrases, chunks, lexical chunks, expressions, um, et cetera, et cetera. There's all sorts of, uh, of phraseology there. Someone asked about reading aloud in the classroom. I'm sort of looking occasionally at the, at the chat screen. Um, I don't like reading aloud, students having reading aloud in the classroom, unless it's rehearsed reading. Um, but I can do a whole new talk about that. Next Cambridge day, I'll do a talk about, about reading text, but let's leave that aside at the moment. Um, uh, these are about 10% of the vocabulary students need to know. So in your vocabulary lists, you should have about one-tenth of the vocabulary. One in 10 items should be a multi-word item, for example, uh, most of which could not be guessed by knowing the component words. So if you get prepositional phrases like of course, if you know of and of and you know course, that doesn't help you know the meaning of of course. Similarly, by the way. Um, what's called binomials, two words joined by and, or are, or, or, um, by and large, you know by, you know large, you don't know what, that doesn't tell you what by and large means. Same thing with fair and square. And of course, all the phrasal verbs. Um, look after, get on with, will you, and, and, uh, and so on. And finally, uh, odd expressions like willy-nilly, um, neither of which words really occurs on their own, only in this joint hyphenated phrase. So these are the sorts of things that we need to be teaching them. Of course, uh, an expression like by and large is actually relatively rare, surprisingly rare, as is fair and square, but of course is very common. By the way, it's very common. You need, I'll be talking in a moment about frequency and choosing the most useful items. Linked to the idea of multi-word items is the idea of collocation. In other words, when you teach a new word, it's a good idea to teach it with other words that it goes, goes with. So for example, it's called collocation. So for example, these are often prepositions. Prepositions are a real headache 
for a lot of students. I'm sure you've found this with your students, knowing which word, which preposition goes after a particular verb or which preposition goes after a particular adjective. Um, for example, angry. For some reason in English, we say angry with. I don't know what, um, what your students tend to say after angry. Uh, my students, Hebrew speakers, tend to say angry on. Instead of, but, so it's, it, I need to teach them angry goes with with. Same with afraid, afraid with of. Um, other kinds, um, for example, the difference between tall and high, which in Spanish it's only one word, alta, I should imagine in Portuguese it's probably the same, um, and which, which would go with either a person or a mountain, but in English you make a distinction between tall and high. Angry at, yes, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and the difference between fast and quick. So fast goes with food or a runner, but quick goes with a quick review or quick question, quick visit. Um, sleep, when you sleep, you sleep soundly, but soundly doesn't really go with anything else, only with sleep or very, I can't, nothing I can think of at the moment, though I may be able to think of it later. Um, and dead, meaning very or completely, goes with right, but it doesn't go with correct. So you need to know what it goes with. And it's useful when you're teaching these, the word, a word like dead, meaning absolutely, to make your students aware what uh, these go with. Okay, I'm just, um, yes, looking at the uh, chat box, corpus linguistic. Yes, I'll be talking about that in a moment. You're quite right. Very relevant. Um, let's move on. Tip number five. Um, we're always taught, or a lot of student teachers are taught, you should pre teach vocabulary of Torah reading text. And my message here is it ain't necessarily so. Don't always. If you teach 10 to 12 new words immediately before reading a new text, what happens is that they probably won't remember what they mean when they encounter them. Because, as I said before, just Encountering them once isn't enough. You're not going to remember um, them immediately. So, um, and there's some evidence also that pre-teaching vocabulary doesn't help comprehension very much. So if you pre-teach, choose a few key items, not, not too many um, key items. The ones which are really important for comprehension, which you know they don't, didn't know yet, or which they need refreshing and teach them the lesson before, even two lessons before, so you leave yourself time to review them so that when they come across in the reading, they're more likely to remember them. But it's fine to teach the new items as they come up. There's nothing wrong with learning the items as you go rather than pre-teaching them, um, because then you're learning them in a meaningful context. They immediately contri contribute to understanding the text, uh, and of course, you need to review later, as I said before. Okay. Um, don't usually, this is where you're going to need your pencil and paper. So get your pen ready. And the tip number six is don't usually ask students to guess words from context. It's a very popular strategy with a lot of teachers. It doesn't usually work. In most cases, they get it wrong. Not because they don't know how to guess, not because they're learners and don't have enough vocabulary, but simply because in most cases um, a word eliminated at random or not known, uh, a random word from a text, is its meaning is not revealed by the surrounding text, even to someone who is a native speaker or a very, very proficient speaker. They get it wrong, they get frustrated, they have a feeling of failure. They are not learning anything because they've guessed it wrong or haven't guessed it. And it's a waste of time. So here, I know that I'm uh, combating a, a myth here, but let's, let's just try it out. Here's a, I'd like this on full screen. No, I'd like the slide on full screen, please. Or you can put it on full screen, that's to say to take up the entire space on the screen or put it on full screen with your, you can click on the bottom 
right hand corner of the uh, screen here, you can put it on the full screen. Okay, can you write down what you would guess on your paper, not in the chat box, on, your, on a piece of paper, um, what you think might be the five missing words here? And I'm going to leave it up for a couple of minutes to give you time to try it. Okay? Can you leave it on full screen, please, for the moment? OK, the next screen also you're going to need full screen because I'm going to show you the answers. Are you ready? Can you tell me if you're ready? Write in the foot in the chat box if you are ready for me to move on. Just say yes if you are, or no if you're not. Yes, no, 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 yes. <laughs> okay, I'll give another few seconds. Okay, I'm going to show you the answers. And what I would like you to note on, on the, in the chat box this time is how many of the five you got right or pretty well right. In other words, you've got something which is very, very close. Okay, okay, here we go. Okay, write in the chat box how many you got right out of the five. I think I would have got two or three maybe. Okay, what we are seeing is none, one, two, three, which is fairly typical. As I said before, it's not that you don't know English and it's not that you're not intelligent and not that you don't have the right strategies. It is simply the fault of the text, that the text does not give away what the word could be. There's no way, for example, you could have known that the last word was bottles. Um, and there's no, and the word globally, five lines up, is very, very difficult to guess. Um, and the others are also difficult. So the answer is it's really, really difficult to guess. And why should we ask our students to guess when they're not going to, probably not going to be able to? It's probably better, Include my conclusion is, guessing from context is not usually very useful. Um, ask students to guess only if you're fairly sure they can do so successfully. In other words, if you are very sure that the, the missing words meaning is clear from the context, ask them to guess. Otherwise, just tell them. That's what you're there for. You're a teacher. Tell them. Let's move on. Okay, number seven. Um, vocabulary from text, and this is someone asked about um, corpora, and this is where the corpora come in. Um, we don't want to teach all the vocabulary from text, because so some of it is not terribly useful. What we want to do is teach the most frequent, useful vocabulary. And it's very useful to know um, what words or expressions from the text are most important for our students to know, right? So how do you know which are the most common? Well, partly it's your own professional judgment, which is, which is a very good start. but uh, we also have the useful tool of corpora, 
Um, and there are what, what's called vocabulary profiles on profiles, profilers online, where you feed in, you copy paste in your own um, uh, text, and the program tells you how frequent, how common, how important the different words in it are. Um, so there are three which I like. I'm going to show you one of them, but let me just tell you which they are so you can choose for yourself. Um, one is Lextooth, which is the one I'm going to show you, um, which divides words into the first thousand, second thousand, third thousand, four thousand, and so on, <coughs> where um, A1, A2 students, sort of beginner or early learners, would be the K1, the first thousand, or K2, second thousand. When you when you get up to K3, you're already B1, um, and so on. That's the sort of level we're talking about. So if you're teaching an elementary class, you'd want to make sure that the K1, K2 um, um, ones uh, would, uh, would be useful to teach. The next one is Text Inspector, which is a Cambridge publication. Um, and which is useful because it it defines the words according to their CEFR level. So instead of saying first thousand, second thousand, most first most thousand most common, second thousand most common, it says this is an A1 word, this is an A2 word, this is a B2 word, which uh, is useful if you're working according to the CFR. And then there's word and phrase, which is based on the American corpus. Um, Corpus of Contemporary American English, COCA, um, and which simply gives uh, a, a rougher uh, distinction between the most common words and more advanced words. Um, so let's look at Lex Tutor, the first one, um, and see what it looks like. Can you put this under, thank you, put it under full screen. If you want to see this more clearly, then click on your full screen um, icon at the bottom right hand corner of this black rectangle here. Um, you, you click on Lex Tutor, the, um, the link which I showed on the previous screen, and it shows you something like this. And what you do is you copy paste um, your um, text into the white uh, oblong in the middle, and then you click on Submit Window, and you um, like which is what I've done now, I've put in the um, the recycling text in there, and then it will give you something like this. You need to scroll down, but you find it, and it's a really useful analysis. So if you look at this, you'll see that all the blue words are fairly low level K1, they're the most uh, common thousand, within the most common thousand words. Um, and then the green ones are the second thousand, so they're slightly less common, but um, a, but also not difficult. And then with the warmer colours, the the yellow and the orange, you get up to sort of B1, B2 level. Um, the if you look at the there's two beige words there, which um, which might you might want to eliminate um, the word toll here, which I would probably take out and, and replace with an easier word, because I don't think it's a very useful word to teach, um, and lag behind. Lag on its own is not very useful. If I'm going to teach it, I'm going to teach it as a full um, expression to lag behind. But otherwise, as I say, the... Um, uh, the overall, it's an overall guide, it's a useful guide, it does need to be tempered by your own um, common sense, your own teaching judgment, um, and also another problem with these programs is they don't usually pick up the multi-word items, they don't pick up the, um, the chunks like, for example, lag behind, um, so you'd need to check out those on your own. So they're not a total answer, but they do help uh, help us select. Tip eight, 
moving complete. It's something different. It's okay to practice words out of context. Uh, we're always told you ought to practice words in context within a sentence or within a, uh, uh, a text, but actually it's okay. Uh, you don't always have to use sentences. It's perfectly okay to practice separate items, words, or expressions, um, particularly as if you always use sentences, it takes a lot longer and we just don't have time to do all that. Um, if, we, if I have the choice between uh, recycling, reviewing 20 words just on their own and five words within sentences, I'm going to, I very often will choose to use, do the 20 words simply because I need to give students opportunities to re-encounter these words and their meanings. Um, single word review is useful or brief phrases. So for example, things like recalling. We've learned 20 words over the last week. How many can you remember? And you write them up on the board as quickly as they can say them. Um, the recalling in itself is a review because it's a, an interesting psychological fact that you don't usually recall, you don't usually recall things you don't understand. So you tend to recall the words that you know the meaning of. And recalling by one student, if you write it up on the board and remind them what it means, um, it'll help the others who didn't remember it to uh, remind themselves of it. Recalling translations. Here's a whole lot of set of words. Quickly, let's translate them or the other way around. Write them up in Portuguese and Spanish. I hope I'm not shocking anyone here and ask them to uh, translate into English. I'll be talking about the use of L1 in a moment. Um, dictations. I'm going to read out words. You write them down. Also dictation I'll be talking a bit more about. Um, odd one out. Can you identify the odd one out? And the yes, no um, technique, which I spoke about a bit earlier. Um, I'm sorry, I'm missing a lot of your questions here because I can't look at the um, chat box at the same time as I'm looking at, thinking about what I'm going to say next and looking at the screen. So um, I hope that uh, Hinata will pick these up and, and ask at the end of the session. Um, words in phrases, as opposed to complete sentences, for example, what adjectives could you apply to the word question? How many phrases can you think of using the word under? And again, it's a brainstorming activity which um, gets them to review separate words. Tip number nine, and this is where you're going to need your pencil and paper again. It's the last time, I promise. Make exercises interesting. Someone asked about uh, games. Um, not exactly talking about games, but I'm talking about making exercises fun, motivating, stimulating, challenging. Let's look and see what we think. Strategies that can make vocabulary tasks more interesting. Okay. For example. Okay, have a look at this. Um, let's, let's say, you don't have to write these down, okay? Don't write them down, just look at them. Um, here's a whole lot of um, words uh, from, or expressions as one, well. there's a couple of uh, expressions as well. Um, from a reading text, what the reading text was doesn't matter. These are the words which I've decided for whatever reason to teach. And I want to know how to do it in an interesting way. And what I want you to do with your pencil and paper now is just jot down this table. All you need to write really is activity and then one, two, three, four, five under it. Okay. The reason is that I'm going to do five different activities and I'm going to um, <coughs> ask you to give each a score on interest on a scale of one to five. So if the activity is really, really boring, you give it a one. If it is absolutely marvelously interesting, you give it a two. Uh, uh, five, sorry. So five is maximum really, really interesting, and one is really boring. Okay, let's go back to our words. Activity one, then, are you ready? Is a gap fill. Okay, so number one 
if you do something two times, we call it. Okay, answer that. And question two, we're still on activity one. Gap fill. Um, we move our arms and legs with the help of our. Mm. And the answer is muscles. Uh, in the winter, rain doesn't fall, but mm does fall. And the answer is snow. Okay, that was activity one. How interesting was that? What score would you give it? Write one if you think it was really boring, five if you think it was really interesting, and anything in between. On your paper, not on the chat. Okay, so within here, opposite activity one, you write your score. If you five, you thought it was really interesting, one if you thought it was really boring. Number two, can you give me a sentence? And here you can write it in on the on the um, um, on the uh, chat box if you like. What um, score would you give it? A, just write giving a sentence using any one of these items. A sentence using any one of these items. Okay, someone like to give me an example. Okay, people who gave the previous one a five, you really thought that was really, really, really interesting, doing a, a gap fill? I think you may have got your numbers wrong. Okay, think about it. Let's go back to this one. This one is, give me a sentence. I study in an international school. I'm afraid of spiders, afraid of not being spoken in the, let's keep in touch. Okay, thank you. How interesting was that? And opposite activity two, please tell me how interesting it was. One, boring, two, fairly boring, three, medium, four, interesting, five, very interesting. Okay, give it a score and we'll move on to number three. Activity three is give me a sentence with any two of the items two of the items. Okay. Give me an, something with two of the items. A sentence with any two. Okay. Let's see what you've got here. I am afraid of Corona. Now I need two words from the from the screen. The wind is freezing. That's okay. It winds and snows here. Yes, okay. The international competition starts now. Nice. I'm afraid of dolphins. Nice. Okay. Can you give that a score, please? With two items. How interesting was that? Number three. How interesting was that? And number four, there's only two more to go. Number four is write in the chat box a statement using any of the items here. You don't need to use two, you can use just one, but a false statement. For example, snow is hot, okay? Anything which is rubbish, which is clearly untrue. It has to be a false statement. Okay, let me see any false statements. Dolphins are mammals, that's actually true. I want a false statement. Okay, you could say dolphins are fish, which, which would be untrue. Dolphins can fly, very nice. Wind is something we can see. The dolphin cannot swim. Dolphins are insects. I sink if I swim. <laughs> dolphins are aggressive. Okay, elephants can swim. I don't know if they can actually, maybe they can. Um, okay, very nice. Can you give that a score, please, between one and five? And the last one. 
The last task is, um, can you write in the chat box a sentence using any of the words, but it has to include I or my or me. In other words, it has to be about yourself and it has to be true. It has to be true. Okay, so I can swim, for example, very simple one, but it has to be true of you. Okay. I'm afraid of touching dolphins. Are you, Betsy? Why? <laughs> They're nice things now to talk to. Okay, more things which you can do. I eat chocolate twice a week. I can touch my dog. Flavia, that's very modest of you. My son can swim. I should do therapy, says Joao. Okay. My internet connection is horrible today. Oh, that's bad. I'm sorry about that. Okay, right. Um, and can you give that a score, please, on one to five? Now, some um, uh, platforms of uh, interaction give you the possibility of doing polls, which, for example, like um, Zoom does, but, but the one we're using today doesn't. So I can't count up your answers, which is a pity. Uh, what I can do is show you the answers I got um, when I did this with another group um, a, a Russian teachers, actually, but uh, I've done it several times, and this is just a typical answer, and their scores looked something like this. The gap fill they found pretty boring, on the whole. Sentence was a bit better. Um, two words was immediately more interesting than doing one word. The false one was even more interesting, and the most interesting was the one where they actually had to um, say things about themselves. There was another one which I did, which I can't do in this platform, which was make up a story with your friends. Um, I put them into uh, breakout rooms and make up a story with your friend of using all the words, but we can't do that. We couldn't do that in this platform. So I just limited to these five. Um, and the it's very clear that the interest was going up each time. And the question is why? <coughs> um, and I'm going to suggest what the answer is because we, we have not enough time, unfortunately, to have a discussion about it. Um, but mainly, um, one important one is open-ended responses. In other words, not there's one right answer, like snow falls in winter, okay? Or two times is the same as twice. So you can say anything you like. So any of the um, any of the tasks after the first had open-ended responses. They were immediately more interesting than the one right answer type. Secondly, a bit of a challenge. You have to think about, is this true or it isn't the true false one? Um, uh, or what connection can I find and put in the same sentence and it's a question of finding links, finding connections, which is higher order thinking rather than just recalling and filling in a um, um, a, um, a gap. And finally, personalization, saying things which are linked to, which links to one, what one of you said earlier on, I noticed in the chat box, the personalization relating the word to myself in some way, which immediately helps me to remember it. Um, so these sorts of things immediately make uh, make a, a a simple word recall activity much much more interesting than the conventional gap fills matching multiple choice, the other stuff which is in the in um, the um, textbooks. Okay. Tip 10, and I only have 10 minutes left, I know, um, but the rest of my tips are, are rather shorter. So tip 10, avoid word games like hangman and word search. <laughs> Very popular, but you actually spend most of your time puzzling, not finding. If you do hangman, you're going to spend most of your time just throwing out letters and only in the last couple of guesses are you going to see the word. Um, they're mainly a waste of time. Same thing with um, computer-generated uh, word searches, 
the word picture here at the top left. Can you find the word picture? How long will it take you to find it? Computer, dog, clothes. Yeah, my favorite game, but I'm sorry I'm 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 uh, ruining things for you. Okay, could you find it? Find these words, anybody? Well, here they are. Very, very difficult to find. Some of them are going backwards, some of them are going slanting, some of them are going up and down. Very, very difficult. Uh, much better to make your own uh, <coughs> homemade words, so if you're going to use them at all, and as I say, I'm not in favor of using them, but if you're going to use them, make your own and uh, make them only go from left to right and downwards. Tip 11, I said I was going to talk about L1. When introducing the meaning of a new item, uh, you've got various options when you when you uh, introduce a new item, all of these, okay, which are up on your screen. Picture, realia, real things, mime, synonym, explanation, examples, context, and translation. Picture is nice for the impact, but maybe ambiguous. Um, how about this one? I want to teach happy, okay? Yes, okay, it looks like happy, but it also could mean smile, it could mean smiley, it could mean um, a face. I don't know why this is a thing there. But if you add the translation, then it's immediately clear. You've got the impact of the picture, but you also made sure that your students know what it means. Reali and mine. Barely have more impact than a picture, but may be ambiguous. And not all items can be represented. Synonym, quick, but only at higher levels, because you can't have synonyms for new words, which they don't know the synonyms of, and may be inaccurate. Explanation, again, for higher levels and added exposure to English, but takes ages. Uh, for example, here's an explanation of disappointed. Ages to explain, much, much quicker just to give them the translation and get on with it. Examples can explain some general terms. For example, you want to explain sweet or sports, you give examples. But not everything is easily explained by examples. Context, yes, but as I've shown before, the context, we looked at that uh, text before, the context does not reveal the meaning. And in fact, if you give them all these examples, it doesn't necessarily reveal the meaning of discuss. Translation, on the other hand, is usually accurate, not entirely, but usually pretty accurate, very quick and very natural, because we naturally, when we're learning a new word, we want to know what it, um, um, what it means in our mother tongue. It really helps. But, of course, not much impact. It's fairly boring. It's quick. It doesn't, doesn't make the impact we want it like a picture does. And the danger of assuming that it may be a one-to-one -one translation, which it isn't. However, my answer is probably best to use pictures, explanations, realia, mime, and so on, plus a quick translation as backup. I think that's, that's the function of translation, to be a backup to the other means just to make sure they know what it means. Tip 12, teach prefixes and suffixes only at advanced levels. Within the most frequent 5,000 words, prefix and suffixes don't help very much for various reasons. Firstly, um, the prefix, they may not, the prefix means very often they're attached to a root, which is incomprehensible. So they may know that auto means self, but the fact that they don't know non nomi or they know id, id, ibl means able to, but they don't know what ed means. And so it won't help in those cases. Um, it may even be, be misleading. For example, dis solve does not mean not to solve. Recall does not mean to call again. Improve does not mean not prove. Or the affix doesn't, doesn't mean what you think it means. Re means again or back, but research has nothing to do with that. Reside has nothing to do with that. 
or they knew the word anyway and the affix doesn't help. For example, they knew the word beautiful, knowing that full means full of doesn't help very much because they didn't know beauty before they know beautiful. Or the affix is ambiguous. Remember, something like in sometimes means not and sometimes means inside, as in the examples I'm showing here. Um, learners may misuse the affix in their own production, and these are authentic examples, unbusy in probation. So they need to be taught only, I think, when studying advanced modern vocabulary, like auto is, us is useful for understanding terms like autopilot, sub, subcommittee, pre-war, but these are all academic advanced words. Or, remember yesterday, unboxing, okay? You know un, then you'll know what unboxing means. Tip 13, don't teach lexical sets together for all together for the same time. Um, for example, don't teach all the colors together, all the parts of the body together. Um, some evidence they aren't very learnt very well. So it's better to teach items that will naturally co-occur in a given context. So better to teach, um, for example, blue with sky rather than blue with red, yellow, green. Okay. So words that occur, as it were, horizontally linked rather than vertically linked. Or if you have a unit on family, don't just teach mother, father, son, daughter, sister, brother, and so on. But all the words that have to do with family and home, uh, different parts of speech, different words that might go together. Tip 14, use dictations. There's all sorts of different kinds of dictations you can use. Um, Translation dictation, in other words, giving them the word in Portuguese, they translate into English or vice versa. Fill in dictation, where you give them, they have the whole sentence, all they have to do is fill in the word in dictation. Completion dictation, where you dictate the beginning of a sentence and they finish it up. Adapt textbook exercises to make open ended. Okay, I'm going to run a bit over time, I apologize, but I really need to show you this one. I talked earlier about closed-ended exercises where each item has one right answer and that's what you get mostly in your textbooks as opposed to open-ended questions which have many right answers um, and open-ended exercises are more learning rich because you get more responses they are more interesting and they afford opportunities for response at different levels so for example here's vocabulary in the sense of irregular past tenses. This is a closed-ended, typical gap fill. And how do we make it open-ended? We delete something. So we delete, for example, the, um, uh, the root form, and we say, OK, write whatever you like. She left early. She went early. She came early. She spoke early. She got up early. and there are reviewing all sorts of different um, past tenses. Or you leave the past, leave the, um, a, the root form. So you want to say she left, but you delete early and they answer all sorts of things which they want. She left the room, she left me, she left her husband and so on and so on. And lots and lots of review, lots of different answers, much more interesting. The principle is delete the end of the sentence or the proposed option or the bank of items. Tip 16, don't spend ages checking a homework exercises in class. If they've done a vocabulary exercise at home, it's much better either to provide the answers and they self-check or check each other in pairs. I ask you only if they're not sure. Or best of all, if you have time, take home their notebooks and check at home. Uh, if you check through an exercise one by one in class using class ping pong, um, it can take up half your lesson and you really need your time. Uh, tip 17, get students to present new vocabulary. You don't have to do it all yourself. Ask them for homework 
to look for a new item to present and tell you about it. Word of the day. Who's going to present the word of the day today? Something you came across in a movie, something you came across on the internet, something that you saw in the street, or phrase of the day. Make sure you have a reserve in case they haven't done their homework, but it's a useful variation. Tip 18, get students to design test items. If you want to test all the vocabulary, get students to design the questions in pairs or for homework or both. Take them in and then design the test based on their ideas. The advantages are the test design is itself review. When they're creating the items, they are reviewing the, the vocabulary as they go. It lowers test anxiety because they, at least some of the items, they know because they've designed them and the students have feel ownership of the test. And 19, use interactive tools in online lessons. Well, um, Herbert talked about this today. He talked about collaboration, but what I'm interested more is activating students. In general, face-to-face -face is better. I don't know when we're going to be able to get back to face-to-face -face teaching. I'd love to do it tomorrow, but it's not going to happen whenever it happens. But at the moment, we're stuck with online tools. And if it's online, make it as interactive as you can using, if you've got a small class up to 20, I'd tell them to turn on their microphones and cameras. And yes, I know teenagers don't like turning on their cameras, but as much as possible. But turning on microphones and allowing them to say their answers rather than write them, um, even if it means interrupting, using the chat box as you're doing now, using breakout rooms, surprisingly easy tool to use, I found with Zoom, and it enables you to do pair work and group work while you're uh, within your lesson, um, and using polls, which is another tool which I've used in Zoom, which is really useful and gets them active. And tip 20, never say never. And this, what this means is that all my tips, they've worked for me, they're useful. I hope you're finding them um, useful as well. And they can also often help, but there may be situations where they don't, and you are the best judge as whether to use them or not to use them, where to use them, if to use them, how to use them. Use selectively or adapt, bottom line, never say never. And thank you very much. And I'm sorry I ran over time. Thank you. Vanny, don't be sorry for running out of the time because the chat here was like uh, joyful and thanking for your <laughs> for your ideas and thoughts. And we're going to start now the Q&A moment. Uh, there were a lot of questions for you. Going on, yeah. Oh uh, no, I understand that this you were talking about the word of the day and even I that do not study as I used to, I have this word of the day that comes every day to my email and to today. It said vocabulary Lovely, is yes. on the horizon. And yeah. Fabio Garcia from Ribeirão Preto, Sao Paulo asks, do students improve their vocabulary better when they contextualize, personalize these vocabulary items? Yes, definitely. Um I think the, the, the basis is they learn them better when they actually do something with them and contextualize them and making them personal to them, as I showed in the exercise we did, um, is, is one very effective way of doing it. Um, there is actually research to show that if you simply just encounter it in the new word in reading, it doesn't uh, work nearly so well as if you actually do something with it you contextualize it as you suggest or, or make it relevant to yourself. Yes, I agree. Yeah. Well, people from Mexico, from Argentina, São Bernardo, Chile, there are a lot of people. Our next question is from Limere, São Paulo, Leonardo Tonasso. What could you say about reading as a teaching strategy to improve students' pronunciation and fluency when, proper, when properly prepared and applied? Um, Okay, I think you're talking about reading aloud. Um, it, it seems from, from the quote, I'm assuming you're talking about reading aloud. Um, I think, uh, two answers here. I think sight reading, in other words, reading a text you've never seen before 
and you're asked to read read aloud in the classroom does not improve anything. It, it, it's, it's very, very difficult for students to do, although some of them like to do it and it's in some um, learning cultures, it's very, very common, um, but it does not really improve um, pronunciation very much. And it's, it's in some ways it stops them understanding because they're focusing so hard on how to pronounce the different words that they don't actually um, think about what it means. And if they don't know what it means, it's obviously not going to contribute to fluency. However, having said that, um, if they're reading aloud something that they've already understood, in other words, you've been through it in the classroom, and um, they're familiar with the meanings and, and uh, what the text actually means, reading aloud then is a good uh, way of improving pronunciation and fluency. Rehearsed reading is even better. Something called Reader's Theatre, which some of you may be familiar with. I can't, haven't got time to go into it now, but those of you who are familiar with it, that's a really good way of improving students' pronunciation and fluency. And Reader's Theatre, which is reading aloud rehearsed text, can actually be used with um, a, uh, a very um, a conventional text, just a, a paragraph from a reading text. Read aloud this text with your friends in a way that makes maximum impact. And then, yes, I agree, it approves both pronunciation and fluency. Before our last, uh, next question, I just come down, or I will come down our chat, who is asking about, yes, uh, Penny's webinar will be available next week on Cambridge Press University, uh, Cambridge University Press YouTube, okay? So you can see the slides again and everything. Now we have a, a question from Marcelo Vicente from Jaiba. He asks, is there, if, is there an effective method for you to, that helps to fix the meaning of the vocabulary being acquired? Um, not one effective method, but some um, strategies are better than others. For example, the use of pictures and realia are really good for fixing the meaning. And, and, and a very interesting piece of research, which I think is not actually on my list, but if you um, uh, uh, email me, I'll, I'll remind you what my email is in a moment, I'll, I'll send it to you. Um, the use of pictures, even for teaching abstract nouns and abstract uh, ideas, is really effective in helping to fix meaning. So you might think about that. For example, if you're teaching a word like fear, showing a person who's really scared uh, will help fix the meaning in, in their mind. So I think pictures, realia, mime, these sort of impactful uh, presentations as well as obviously uh, an exciting and interesting context. Well, perfect. Uh, we have this next question from Clady Oliveira. Actually, she's saying, in public school, the focus is on uh, acquisition of vocabulary for NN. I don't know if you were aware, it's our it's exam, national exam for you to graduate to the college. So many still know many uh, students know many isolated words, but I don't know how to use them. But they don't know how to use them in real life. How can we help them? How can we help when students are focused on getting a grade or passing in a test uh, to uh, get more deeper in not knowing just isolated words, but also to use them in real life? Yeah. Um, I think two answers to this. One is um, what I suggested before, using words in phrases, getting them to use words together with um, other words like, for example, you want to practice a word like um, busy. So you say um, what sorts of things can be busy and make them combine with other words, even without putting them in full sentences. Um, or uh, uh, another exercise, all the exercises I suggested for the when we were doing that experiment with interest, they all get the things to put them in, um, in context. Um, another a idea which was suggested by one of my students in a, in a master's course I was leading recently, and she suggested giving students a list of all the words um, uh, they've, been, they've been learning over the last uh, few weeks and ask them to prepare presentations which include all of these. Now, the presentation could be 
a description or a story or anything, but they have to actually present, including as many of the words as they can, which makes them contextualizing. Okay. okay. Anna Guedes asks, uh, Penny, your activity, you've just asked us this to fill in the blanks, can be considered a closed test? Um, yes, basically, which means that closed tests are very difficult to do sometimes. And when people are <laughs> choosing which uh, word to take out, um, they... Um, they should make sure that it's a word which can, in fact, be guessed. In fact, I mean, all the words which I took out, because it's, it's a session on vocabulary, they were all lexical words. If you take out grammatical words like is or the, they're usually easier to guess. Oh, uh, I just uh, missed one information uh, from our last uh, question, the question before that, Claudia Oliveira actually is one of the tutors who is in closest contact uh, with Cambridge University Press. She's from Altamira, Pará. Nice to have you here. Nice to have you all here. I think we are going to our last question. Oh, I have to, because people are talking with me too, uh, Mrs. Penny, I'm sorry, <laughs> sometimes I get, so, or, or I have to, and because we have still a lot, yeah, this is the last question, we need okay. to finish, I'm really sorry, <laughs> because your fans are here asking still on our web chat. <laughs> Thank okay. you very much for being here, well, any last say, words? Can you just say one more thing? Cla of course, well, please. I just want to mention that my, um, Email, which is, could you just show the slide? The last slide. Uh, my email is up there. If any of you want to ask further questions or make further comments, please feel free to email me at this address. And uh, just to remind you what I said at the beginning that the um, research references and background are in the later slides on this, actually on this uh, presentation, just giving you a glance here. So if any of you are interested in these, um, the slides will be available, won't they, Hanata, on the, on the Cambridge yeah. site? You'll be able to yeah. download them. So that's all I wanted to say. And, and thank you very much for listening and participating. Thank you, thank you very much for your time with our, uh, Penny. It was an honor and a pleasure to have you here. Thank and you, have Hanata, a day. And thanks and to and everyone bye -bye. for participating. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Good night. And not only a big thank for Penny, but also a big thank you to the ones of you who already donate via the QR code to Assam Pela Cidadania, the NGO benefited by this year's Cambridge Day event. This is a renowned NGO in Brazil that has fought against hunger and poverty since 1993. And I would also extend our thanks to all partners that believe in our projects and initiatives. A uh, Gisal, Livraria Martins Fontes, da Vida Paulista, SBS São Paulo, SBS Rio de Janeiro, Del Books, A Página, Livraria Canal do Livro, ACF Distribuidora. I uh, will share the link for the certificate on the, on the chat and remember that this certificate is editable, so you can put your name on it, you can add your name on it and then save it as a PDF, okay? Let's make a quick break, a very quick break, and I will see you soon in our next link. Bye.